I want to welcome you to the third of this year's Stores Lectures. Uh, this year's lectures, as I'm sure you know by now, you in particular who managed to come to the third one, um, are being presented by George Fletcher, uh, Cardozo Professor of Jurisprudence at Columbia Law School. Professor Fletcher has already been introduced to you twice. Impressive as George's accomplishments are, there's only so much flattery anyone can take. So I won't tell you again about his books and articles, about his profound and diverse contributions to jurisprudence, nor will I dwell on his astounding language capacities. I do, however, want to say something about a side of George that I might be uniquely positioned to speak to, at least among those in this room, and that is George as a teacher. I was lucky enough to have George as one of my teachers in my first semester at the Yale Law School. Listening to him in the last two lectures has reminded me of just how wonderful that class was. For I see again the same teacher I had 25 years ago. First, there is the complete dedication to ideas, and most especially to the idea of justice. Second, there is a sense that we are engaged in a common project. George has welcomed criticisms of his ideas. He has invited dialogue. Third, I remember the seriousness, seriousness with which he listened to his students. I think each of us felt that we were engaged personally with George. He has done that again over the last three days. 25 years ago, George showed me that the law was an exciting intellectual discipline, that there was no real break at all in moving from philosophy to law. He showed me as well the virtues of a truly great teacher. His first two lectures reminded us all that law gives us a point of access to the profoundest philosophical problems that we confront. He has shown us how to confront those problems in a spirit of creativity and dialogue. For we have not let him get away with much in the presentation of his ideas, and he has welcomed us as partners in the inquiry. Today's lecture, Guilt by Analogy, promises to be particularly exciting. For at the end of his last lecture, George told us that he had purposely dug himself into a hole from which he must now extricate himself. He has done so by showing us that despite our liberalism, we are in many important ways still deeply committed to an idea of collective responsibility of the nation. In the first lecture, lecture he argued that in what many of us take to be the proudest achievement of contemporary liberalism, the creation of a vital international criminal law, we find an irreducible element of collective action. Then in the second lecture, he showed us that attempts to recognize this collective responsibility and the actual attribution of guilt and punishment to individuals will lead us to morally <clears throat> unacceptable positions. We seem to find ourselves caught between the romantic excess of too much guilt, original sin, and too little guilt, guiltless sincerity. Today's lecture promises a way out of the hole. With that, I welcome George Fletcher. Paul, I think actually that was the most uh, touching introduction of all of them. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, perhaps you know the story of uh, Henry Hart when he gave a series of three lectures at Harvard some, I don't know, 30 years ago. And uh, in the, much of the style of these lectures, he presented the thesis in the first lecture. And then in the second lecture, he presented an antithesis. And then he got up for the third lecture and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I've been thinking about it and I think the antithesis won and I don't have anything to say and he sat down. Well, that's not going to happen today. Even though, and perhaps it should happen, because I think that the argument has reached an impasse of sorts. On the one hand, we can be sure that the foundations of international criminal law lie in the notions of collective as well as individual action. Because crime entails guilt in at least some sense, it should follow that collective entities that commit collective crimes incur collective guilt. If the nation is the collective agent, then the nation bears collective guilt for the crimes that it supports and sponsors. This all follows from the arguments of the first lecture. The conflict between liberals and romantics turns on whether we should take nations seriously as agents in morality and in law. My claim is that for romantics, reality offers more possibilities than meet the eye of the ordinary person. 
This leads to a willingness to affirm the existence of collective entities like that of the nation and see the nation and see these entities in general as expressive actors in history. Liberal sensibilities with the resulting focus on individuals fail to deliver the ontology that we need to make sense of international crimes like genocide and aggression. Yet as we saw in the second lecture, this romantic conception of nationhood and of collective guilt leads to unacceptable consequences. It supports the moral distortion of believing that guilt is transmitted by birth, a doctrine that violates liberal commitments to the uniqueness of every person and the idea that all children are born equal. Also, the romantic preoccupation with sincerity and internal integrity leads to a breakdown in our confidence that ideological criminals really deserve punishment. In the face of these intellectual currents pushing us toward collective guilt and then repelling us, it's hard to stabilize our inquiry. I propose that we look for anchors in the concepts that occupy the neighborhood of collective guilt and assess whether we can ground a convincing analogy in any of these proximate ideas. So here is the field of analogical play. Imagine these six possibilities. The vertical columns are responsibility, shame, and guilt. And the horizontal are individual and collective. That leads to six possibilities. I shall refer to these uh, as relational attitudes because in different ways all arise in the context of human relationships. Briefly, responsibility requires an account to another person. Shame expresses the discomfort of being exposed to another. And guilt puts one in the situation of expecting hostility and punishment from another. We have to be mindful of the difference between the actor's internal view of the particular attitude, responsibility, shame, or guilt, and whether others impose it in the relationship. This is critical in the analysis of guilt, where we must be sensitive to the distinction between feeling guilty and actually being guilty. Here then is my methodology. We begin with the individualized version of the relational attitude and explore the differences among them. And then I shall try to move from the first column, from the first row to the second row, that is, from the individualized version to the collective version. And finally, if I can manage to get into squares four or five, I will try to reason by analogy with the aim uh, ending up in square six, namely collective guilt as established by analogy to the other uh, possibilities. So let's begin with square one, individual responsibility. This simply means that one person must respond, give an account to another person. The duty to give an answer might arise without any personal fault. For example, it might be based solely on having caused harm or being the person in charge when the harm occurs. Indeed, the idea of responsibility might even extend to future behavior. Students are responsible for certain cases prescribed by the syllabus. They must answer in class when questioned about the material. That is, they're responsible for the preparation toward the future, not for the past. A responsible person who is, is one that who, who can be counted on in the future, not only to give an accounting, but to do what he or she is supposed to do. The negation of responsibility is very suggestive, particularly in comparison with the negation of shame and guilt. Indeed, there are two variations of the negation of responsibility. A non-responsible person is someone who cannot be expected to give any account at all. 
By contrast, an irresponsible person is someone who will give you a self-incriminating account. That if you ask, why did you do that and you're irresponsible, you'll get a self-incriminating account. Neither can be relied upon in the future. Curiously, being responsible for a crime in the positive sense carries a denunciatory tone close to being guilty for the crime. But think of the striking difference in the negations. Being non-responsible means that you are not guilty. But being irresponsible implies that you are even more guilty than simply being the responsible person. We can already detect a major difference between responsibility and guilt. The former speaks to the future as well as the past. It raises questions of capacity and propensity. We say, uh, by describing someone as responsible, non-responsible, or irresponsible, we say something about their character, how they will behave over time. Guilt is always connected to a particular deed in the past. To say that someone is guilty implies another question. Guilty for what? That is, you can say of someone, they're responsible, but not responsible for what? But if you say they're guilty, you have to say, guilty for what? In this respect, guilt is like punishment, where the question, punished for what, always seems to apply. At least there is no particular difficulty in moving from square one to square four from reasoning by analogy from individual to collective responsibility. If a single person can be responsible for a child in his care, then a team of babysitters can take responsibility as well. If something happens to the child, they, all together and as individuals, must provide an accounting. And they have, may have to stand responsible in the sense of accepting civil liability. The collective duty to act seems relatively easy to establish, and that duty in turn provides the basis for, quote, joint and several liability in tort or in contract. They are responsible for the whole damage, thus implying complicity in each other's behavior. The very fact that collective responsibility is based on complicity, that fact, however, reveals an important difference between this attitude and a feature of collective guilt that we explored in lecture two. The collective responsibility of the babysitters is aggregated, not associative. We may think of collective guilt as associative, as coming together to be the guilt that inheres in the nation as such, but re collective responsibility does not have that feature. It is always an aggregate form of responsibility. At least it always seems that way to me. Now let me move on to shame. Let's consider how the notion of shame plays itself out first on the individual and then on the collective level. Shame comes in so many different varieties that it is hard to sort them out. People can feel shame for their bodily defects, for their actions, for the actions of their children, and if they are teenagers, they might feel shame for the very presence of their parents. A rather simple distinction holds between shame and guilt. People feel shame for who and what they are and guilt for what they've done. That is why shame can connect with bodily parts and stand totally outside the criteria of responsibility. Guilt about what you have done can make you feel shame for who you are. That is, the person who could have done such a thing. But the inverse relationship does not hold. To get from shame to guilt, we have to proceed by analogy. We might be able to argue that if you are ashamed of something, then perhaps you ought to feel guilt as well. That is, I could move from square two to three. The great text for learning about shame is none other than the Bible's account of the Garden of Eden. The same text that is invoked to teach us about the fall and original sin. The actual language of Genesis 
more readily supports a lesson about shame than about disobedience, sin, or guilt. We can pinpoint the moment when Adam and Eve first feel a relational sentiment. When first created, quote, they were both naked, Adam and his wife, and they were not ashamed. After they eat of the forbidden fruit, quote, their eyes were both opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves. This is the transformative moment. And it links the idea of shame most closely with the genitals. Genesis grasped the seemingly universal truth that people feel shame about having their genitals exposed. It is not entirely clear why. Some people think the genitals reveal how much like animals we really are. And this is the source of our consciousness of shame. But we share at least four basic functions with animals. Sex, excretion, eating, and sleeping. We feel shame about the first two. The second, namely excretion, is so taboo that it is not even discussed in the Bible. But the latter two impulses, namely eating and sleeping, things that we have in common with animals, are perfectly acceptable. They're the mainstay of all long-distance airplane flights. I, don't, I can't offer you an easy explanation as to why two of these so-called animal functions uh, are the cause or the occasion of shame, and two others are not. Even Adam's opening one their eyes is essential to their feeling shame. The core experience of shame is feeling exposed, subject to the gaze of another. There's no suggestion in the text that either Adam or Eve judged each other harshly, or blamed each other, or felt anything in particular, but they were aware of each other's eyes. The first reaction to each other's eyes was to sense the nakedness of that part of the body associated with shame. The response to shame as to nakedness is to avoid the gaze. This requires one to cover oneself up symbolically, by sewing physically as well as symbolically, by sewing together fig leaves. The concept of nakedness appears again in the story after Adam and Eve clothed themselves. God comes into the garden and purports not to know where Adam is. This, of course, is a rather amusing quest by a supposedly omniscient God. The divine search for Adam enables the man, now with eyes opened, to say that he was hiding. He had heard the voice of God in the garden and he felt that something that made him sense his nakedness and required him to hide. The something that Adam felt after he heard the voice of God is critical to the passage. The word, the Hebrew word, ira, is often translated with a connotation of fear. That is, this is what Adam, the way the original text describe Adam's feeling is it's used of the verb ira. I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. In my view, the better translation of this word ira, I was afraid, is the typical translation. The better translation is, I felt awe or reverence. Adam felt naked because he was in awe of God. He could not feel awe unless he also felt separate and able to see God for a power other than himself. Adam and Eve feel shame toward each other, but their sentiment relative to God is not shame, but awe and respect. The common theme is separation. They can feel shame only when their eyes tell them that they are separate beings, and they can feel awe toward God only after they become like gods themselves, having tasted of the fruit and knowing the difference between good and evil. Offering this interpretation of Eden is important for several reasons. 
First, it gives us a mythological account of the origins of shame in the experience of seeing and being seen. Second, it provides a plausible reading of Adam and Eve's conduct totally different from the Christian story of disobedience, fall, and corruption of the human condition. The idea of original sin, the doctrine of transmission by birth that troubled us in the last lecture, is by no means a necessary or even a compelling implication of the biblical text. The more plausible reading of the story leads to a conclusion not of disobedience, but rather of separation from the parent creator and the acquisition of knowledge that would enable one to think of oneself as an autonomous being. God's ambivalence toward Adam and Eve seizing their autonomy is revealed in the acts of providing skins and clothing for them before they are expelled from the garden. I would not, that is the, the complicity of God in the entire affair is obvious. I wouldn't say that this brief exposition solves all the problems of the text, but it's a plausible beginning. Shame in individuals, we can conclude, has a sound grounding both in our experience and in our mythology. The feature that makes it different from responsibility and guilt, however, is its non-rational quality. There's nothing logical, so far as I can tell, about feeling shame for one's genitals. And indeed, in nudist colonies, people can easily overcome their habit of genital shame. nor is there anything particularly well-reasoned. It doesn't follow that shame is, uh, sorry, there's nothing, uh, that minorities typically feel shame about their presence and their role in our society. Therefore, we have this metaphor of being in the closet because being exposed is a shameful situation. But there's nothing rational about this sense of shame for being, who, what, for being different from uh, the dominant image in the society. On the whole, the practice of coming out from the closet, of overcoming the tendency toward shame, is a very wholesome quality. It is something that we celebrate, so that we have a kind of built-in ambivalence toward the very phenomenon of shame. At the one hand, we try to get over it as much as possible, but at the same time, I have to concede that shame has a very healthy function in supporting basic moral restraints. Feeling ashamed, say, for cheating or committing adultery, things that are not necessarily uh, discovered, is a healthy reaction and it strengthens our ties with others. With this clarification of shame as an individual experience, can we infer by analogy the phenomenon of collective shame? Consider the problem assayed by a German philosopher named Anton Leist as he reflected on the experience of Germans who visit Auschwitz. Some feel shame and others do not. What should the first group say to the second? That they ought to feel shame? You would not say to these, if you felt shame and there was another group that did not, you wouldn't say to them, as parents say to children, you ought to be ashamed to you of yourself. That somehow doesn't fit. It's hard to imagine a duty to feel shame. We just noted with regard to shame about being gay or being Jewish or being the victim of a rape, for example, that there's no rational basis for the sentiment. There could hardly be a duty to do that which could be wrong or irrational, that is, to feel the shame. All we can say is that some people have the experience and some people do not. If all or just about all Germans experienced shame when they visited Auschwitz, we could say that they collectively as well as individually experienced shame. Another interpretation of collective shame might be that Leicht and others like him feel shame in their capacity or their aspect of being German. The same way that I feel shame if I visit the uh, nuclear museum, the museum in, the, in, Hiro in Hiroshima. Uh, 
I feel ashamed about that aspect of myself that is connected to the event. The German feels shame about a personal characteristic that he shares with an entire nation. In this situation, it would not matter how many of his compatriots shared the feeling. Note that in both of these senses, the notion of collective shame is clearly aggregated. It consists in the sum total of the feelings of shame experienced by particular individuals. Now no, notice, in either of these theories of collective shame, that is, large numbers of people feel the shame, or it's collective in the sense that I am ashamed about an aspect of myself that unites me with the group, that as the aspect of my nationality, the nationality having been implicated in the actions to begin with. So I feel shame about my belonging to the group that has committed the crimes. Either way, we've crossed the line from individual uh, to collect individuality to collectivity in the cases of both responsibility and shame. So I can claim to be in squares four and five. The challenge that faces me is whether I can reason horizontally from four and five to collective guilt in square six. To negotiate that kind of an analogical argument, I have to think more deeply about the nature of guilt and how it is similar and different from responsibility and shame. When we discuss responsibility and shame, we start naturally with the cases of individuals and reason by analogy to collectives. That is, we assume that the individual case is the starting point. It's the more basic case. In the case of guilt, this starting point is not so obvious. If we go back to the Hebrew Bible, we find a notion of guilt with contours radically different from our current assumptions that guilt is basically individual and subjectively felt. When we first encounter guilt in, the, in Genesis, the concept is both collective and objective. The term appears in a story told three times in the lives of the patriarchs. It's one of the fascinating things about this story for me that you get the same story told three times. The pattern is always the same. One of the fathers of the Jewish people is about to enter a foreign land where he suspects that the barbarians will kill him and take his wife. Therefore, Abraham twice and Isaac once relive the same deception. They tell the foreign potentate that their wife is in fact their sister. In all three cases, something happens to inform the potentate that either he or the men of his court are about to commit adultery. In the first version, Abraham passes Sarah off as his sister. Pharaoh takes her into his court. Plagues then descend upon, quote, Pharaoh and his house as a sign that a sexual sin had occurred or was about to occur. Pharaoh quickly realizes that something is wrong in the natural order and confronts Abraham with his lie. In the later retelling of the same story with a potentate named Abimelech, the truth of sexual sin is realized not by a plague, but by God's coming to the king in a dream and saying, quote, Behold, you are but a dead man because of the woman you have taken. She is a man's wife. In the third telling, and this is where this is the one that is critical. In the third telling, Isaac passes off Rebecca as his sister. They're married, but he passes off Rebecca as his sister. This time, the king is also named Abimelech. And when Abimelech discovers the, he discovers the lie, when he sees the couple engaging in affectionate behavior that would be incest if they were actually brother and sister. So one of the interesting, fascinating sidelights of this whole story is that the king knows that incest is prohibited and assumes that it's prohibited in identifying the couple as obviously not brother and sister. 
Assuming that they are not committing incest, Abimelech confronts Isaac, establishes the lie, and then says, what is this that you have done to us? One of our people might have easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. This is how the notion of guilt makes its appearance on the biblical stage. In those places where you would expect to find it, after Adam and Eve eat of the fruit, after Cain kills Abel, after Ham abuses his father Noah, the concept is absent. Adam and Eve feel shame, not guilt. And Cain complains that his sin, his avon, sometimes translated as punishment, is too great for him to bear. But the word guilt is not present. It is clear that the word guilt, asham, is understood at the time as something like a stain, a form of pollution on the people. The stain afflicts the entire nation of Pharaoh and Abimelech. And significantly, Abimelech says to Isaac, you are bringing guilt on us, on our people, implicitly not on yourself, Isaac, and not on Rebekah. The one who's responsible for the situation, the one who lied, is paradoxically not affected by the guilt. The sign of sin in the first telling of this tale is the plague that descends on Pharaoh and his house, reminiscent of the plague that descends on Thebes as the first sign that Oedipus has engaged in acts contrary to the natural order. The plague is evidence of pollution, of contamination generated by human action. The idea that guilt is pollution bears several features that can only jar our modern sensibilities. The guilt is collective, it is objective, and it is the same for everyone. Also at odds with our contemporary thinking is the total irrelevance of fault or blameworthiness. The men prepared to sleep with Sarah or Rebecca have no idea that she is married and that the union would be adulterous. Nevertheless, they bring a plague on the land and they bring guilt on the people. Again, the analogies with Oedipus are compelling. The sins of patricide and of incest inhere in the act itself, regardless of personal culpability. This is what Carl Jaspers had in mind when he wrote of moral guilt as a consequence simply of acting. The remedy for guilt in the sense that the term is used in the Hebrew Bible, is to bring a sacrifice. The sacrifice cleanses the stain. Remarkably, the word used in Leviticus 5 to describe a whole range of sacrifices described in Leviticus in this, in this passage is also the same word that is used for guilt, asham. The prescription is to bring, quote, a guilt sacrifice to atone for the guilt, for the specific sins. Burnt, uh, there's some of the, sometimes the offering is for the sin, and sometimes it's a burnt offering for other sins. Sometimes it's a sham, it's a guilt offering, sometimes a burnt offering. The confusion here between the deed and the remedy, the interchangeability of the same word for the deed and the remedy, it uh, recalls the controversy about translating the word that Cain uses in his complaint that something about his fratricide is too difficult to bear. Sometimes the word is avon, and sometimes it is translated as punishment, but actually it means sin. So the sin and the punishment are the same word. This uneasy interchange of the negative and the positive, the contamination and the decontamination, reveals the tight conceptual connection between the two. Walter Burkhart, historian of Greek religion and culture, has a, take, a slightly different take 
on this easy association of guilt and punishment in the ancient world. He suggests that in fact those who committed the offense requiring a sacrificial response actually tendered feelings of guilt and these subjective feelings are projected onto the sacrifice. This account does not square with the language of the Bible, but perhaps both are correct, each in its own context. The hypothesis seems safe that the ancient world understood these concepts in a way totally different from the way we do. In contemplating whether Oedipus feels guilt or shame for his fated patricide and incest, it is often said that the Greeks at the time of Sophocles did not distinguish between the two concepts. They are, there are signs of both guilt and shame in the play. When Oedipus discovers his crime, he craves punishment as though he were guilty in the modern sense. But the method of his self-inflicted punishment, putting out his eyes and going into exile, resonate with shame. He cannot bear to see others looking at him. While the ideas of guilt and shame are interwoven in Athens, they are distinct in Jerusalem. The biblical culture establishes a clear a line of shame in the story of Eden and a distinct stream of guilt and guilt sacrifices. Even in Athens, there are clear differences between Sophocles and Aristotle, who was born a century later than the playwright. The Nicomachean ethics continues to be a guide to the general theory of responsibility and enables us to understand the concept of guilt as it is used today. The historical map is obviously very complicated. But one generalization appears compelling. In the last 2,500 years in the West, we have undergone a major transformation in our thinking about guilt. The major change has been the movement from the objective phenomenon of pollution to the subjective condition of blameworthiness. <clears throat> and the modern condition has two dimensions that we have to keep distinct. It's being objectively guilty and subjectively feeling guilty. Along with this change, there's been a shift from guilt as a fixed quantity, the same for everyone, to the concept of guilt as a matter of degree. The striking assumption of modernity is that some people are more guilty than others. Their relative degrees of guilt depend on two factors. First, how much they contribute or how close they come to causing physical harm. And second, their internal knowledge of their action and its risks. That's basically a distinction between actus reus and mens rea, or the action and the intent. The principal who controls the actions leading to harm is more guilty than the accessory who merely aids in the execution of the plan. Remember our discussion yesterday of Stashtinsky, where the actual agent who carries out the uh, assassination is less guilty than the directors of the KGB who uh, command the conduct. Those who take risks intentionally are worse than those who do so inadvertently. These assumptions about relative guilt are built into the modern way of thinking about crime and punishment. These shifts from the external to the internal, from the categorical to the scalar, account for another important conceptual transformation. The notion of guilt in the biblical culture was connected with a particular kind of response, the sacrifice of animals in a religious ritual. In the modern secular understanding of guilt, the linkage is not with sacrifice in the temple, but with punishment prescribed in court. As Herbert Morris writes, to be guilty is among other things, both to owe someone, uh, something to, some, uh, to another and to be the justified object of hostility. 
Morris emphasizes the element of indebtedness in the modern uh, conception of guilt. And it's this factor of indebtedness that provides a bridge between the duty to sacrifice and the duty to suffer uh, punishment. In German, there's a, there's a linguistic suggestion of the relationship between the concept of Schuld, which is guilt, and the concept of Verschulden, which is indebtedness. But when you have an association like that in one language, in one language only, uh, I, I'm not entirely impressed. It's suggestive, but I don't know what it necessarily reveals. The process of secularization of guilt should not lead us to forget one very important aspect of guilt in the modern understanding. As Paul Ricoeur points out in The Symbolism of Evil, a guilty person suffers from a particular sense of unworthiness, a loss of self-esteem that leads to a craving for punishment as the fitting externalization of this internal self-depreciation. In our current post-apartheid and post-communist uh, uh, political situation, the need for punishment can be satisfied as well by public confessions of guilt. This transformation of guilt is much too deep and too radical to be attributed to any single historical process. It's difficult even to date the transformation. It would seem to be older than the rebellion of the German romantics against the French Enlightenment in the beginning of the 19th century. But it's not clear when the shift occurs. Does it take place with the preaching of the Hebrew prophets, with the emergence of Christianity and its conception of individual salvation, or with the 16th century Protestant doctrine of salvation by faith alone? These religious movements account neither for the secularization of guilt nor for the grading of guilt as a matter of degree. Nor can the history of religion account for the modern phenomenon of free-floating guilt and its detachment from all external anchors. The modern condition is best expressed in the plight of Kafka's Joseph K. He knows he is charged with something. He, is regarded, uh, he regards himself as guilty for something, but he does not know what. He must wander the maze of the law in search of the trial that will resolve his anxiety about his internal state of unworth unworthiness. It's as though he is Oedipus, but with the plagues internalized and without a truth that can be discovered. Among all these transformations is another that is critical for purposes of this investigation, namely a shift in the presumed point of departure from collective to individual guilt. Our, collect our entire investigation has taken for granted that the burden of proof is on the advocate of collective guilt. For the ancients, particularly the ancient Hebrews, collective guilt was the normal instance of the concept. Though we must accept the conventional assumption that individual guilt is well understood and collective guilt is problematic, it's hard for me to believe that we could entirely escape the influence of the past. The biblical understanding, as reflected in the story of Isaac and Abimelech, must remain with us in some fashion. The ancient understanding seeps through our intuitions and opens us up to the possibility of collective guilt for collective crimes. If we're going to go modern, then we should go all the way and start our inquiry with the common experience of individuals who feel guilty. This feeling is usually coupled with a sense of unworthiness and a craving to be punished. Jaspers' categories that we discussed yesterday, or the first and the second lecture, leave out this particular quality of feeling guilty. But that's now where I shall begin. As Oedipus and Abimelech are paradigmatic figures for the ancients in their approach toward guilt as an objective phenomenon, Raskolnikov is the exemplar of the modern man who knows precisely what he has done but fails to grasp the moral qualities of his actions. He undergoes a process of discovery, as did Oedipus and Abimelech. Raskolnikov captures the existential situation of all the ideological killers who know precisely what they have done but who have yet to discover their guilt 
for having put their hand to evil. The process of discovery carries with it the sudden explosion of guilt, a sudden explosion of truth. The repression caves in and the feeling of honesty overwhelms. The reaction can often be violent, as in the case of Oedipus, or it can be therapeutic and it can lead to a reconciliation with victims or with oneself. The important implication for our purposes is that this process of exploration and discovery applies to groups as well as to individuals. An entire culture can support slavery, but the mass of people will be able to ignore the humanity of their fellow human beings only so long. Sooner or later the truth will break through and the abolitionist spirit will be born. These political transformations cannot but invite a sense of guilt for the mistakes of the past. For Germans living after the war, the critical experience was apparently a television series named Holocaust, a series that told the story of one Jewish family exposed to systematic persecution and mass murder. Suddenly, thousands of people understood for the first time the depth of the crime that their fellow countrymen had committed. Philip Roth provides us with a modern literary, literary example in The Human Stain, a magnificent title alluding to original sin and the problem of collective guilt. Coleman Silk, a high-ranking professor and dean at Athena College, refers to two persistently absent students as spooks. Unbeknownst to him, the missing students are African Americans. The remark takes on racial overtones and it is widely publicized as a bigoted reference to blacks. The entire campus turns against Silk, drives him out of his job, and continues to haunt him with charges of sexual, uh, sexual exploitation for dating a woman much younger than himself. His death in an automobile accident breaks the mood of hostility and prompts people to reconsider their knee-jerk knee politically correct responses. At his funeral service, a black professor named Herb Keble, as Silk's first hire at the university, takes the podium and confesses his cowardice in failing to defend Silk. His language is revealing. I stand before you to censure myself for having failed my friend and patron and to do what I can to begin to attempt to right the wrong, the grievous, contemptible wrong that was done to him by Athena College. Kebel confesses not only his personal guilt, but the collective guilt of the entire community. He discovers something about himself, that he was cowardly and disloyal toward a friend. And he feels guilty. But he also senses that everyone around him shares the same weakness of character. He adds that the mistreatment of silk remains a blight on the integrity of the institution to this day. He points the finger at everybody else at the same time that he indicts himself. The liberal response to this argument is Keble is not only accusing other individuals, is only accusing them at best of complicity in his own wrongdoing. But in fact, he's doing more than that. He's arguing that the whole college community is guilty. They provided reciprocal emotional support for their persecution of, of silk. And they acted as a group in the sense that their intentions, attitudes, and actions were all self-consciously interdependent. The group consciousness deprives them of their ordinary capacity for compassion, for self-correction by reference to the attitudes of others. Simply standing in a one-to-one -one relationship, no one would have been hostile towards Silk for an understandable mischoice of word, a slip of the tongue. To say that the entire college is guilty is not to suppose that there is a separate being someplace called the college and that this being feels guilty. It's rather to trade implicitly on a well-established philosophical argument about collective intentions and collective actions. 
As John Searle argues about intentions, we can, in a reciprocal understanding of what we are doing, share a collective intention. We might have this form of we intention in taking a walk together, playing in a quartet, or sitting in a legislature and passing a law. If we can have the consciousness of acting and intending as a group, we can surely tender feelings as a group. These feelings might be hostility, contempt, or, as in Herb Kebley's example, feelings of guilt for a wrong that we have committed together. Collective guilt of the college might have been possible, but Keble did not establish it by generalizing it from his own feelings. His argument trades on a confusion between being, feeling guilty and being guilty. The steps in the inference go like this. I feel guilty, therefore I am guilty. The rest of the college has the same reason to feel guilty as I do, therefore the whole college is guilty. The giant hole in this argument arises from his, his assuming that the others feel the way he does and he can make the same weak inference from their feelings to their state of guilt. You cannot get the same logical slippage in talking about shame because there's no similar gap between feeling shame and being ashamed. I cannot argue about another person that she is ashamed if she feels nothing of the sort. If I feel shame at the museum in Hiroshima and a fellow American feels no shame at all, I might be able to say, you ought to feel shame. But I cannot say about shame as I can about guilt that you are in fact ashamed even though you have no feelings of the kind. I can say about guilt, you are guilty even though you feel nothing. But I cannot say about shame, you are in fact ashamed even though you don't feel it. The reason for this difference, I believe, is that shame never enjoyed the mythical history associated with guilt. From the beginning in the Garden of Eden, the concept of shame was used much as it is today, a sentiment of shortcoming felt in the eyes of another. It was never a taint that could be expunged by sacrifice or punishment. But guilt, as we have seen, has its roots in the practice of sacrificing animals to expiate sins, and in particular to cleanse the community of guilt that its members have brought upon it. It's clear that many philosophers with liberal leanings would prefer either of the weaker terms, that is, responsibility or shame, to the concept of collective guilt. The use of collective responsibility seems to avoid all of the baggage associated with the staining, the cleansing, the distortions of original sin and guiltless sincerity. And shame has the same appeal. Can we start with one of these more appealing concepts and reason by analogy up the scale to collective guilt? I doubt it. If we start with responsibility, we will find it hard to capture that special sense of unworthiness that attaches to guilt, both to the state of being guilty and to feelings of guilt. Shame has no distinction parallel to that between being guilty and feeling guilty, nor does shame admit of the distinguishing feature which is the process of discovery about actions in the past. You might say of people that they discover their responsibility for deeds in the past, but the experience of recognizing responsibility is usually no more overpowering than an impulse to open one's checkbook. In the end, I think the most convincing analogy lies simply from individual to collective guilt, an inference that piggybacks to some extent on the ancient understanding of collective guilt as a stain on the community. If we, don't, if we can't reason up the scale from four and five to six, it's also clear that many people try to displace their sense of collective guilt by reasoning downwards. That is, they displace the natural sentiment of collective guilt by arguing that what they're really talking about is collective shame or collective responsibility. A good example uh, of using collective shame as a euphemism for collective guilt comes to the fore in a very thoughtful essay by Andra Shoyo about his living as a Jew in post-Holocaust Hungary. Shoyo argues that Hungarian Christians should feel collective shame 
for their participation in the mass murder of Jews after the German invasion of March 1944. As a recognition of this shame, he claims they should be willing to make reparations to the victims and their families. And as a liberal who believes in the paradigm of guilt exclusively for individual actions, he uh, eschews collective guilt and adheres to this idea that shame will do the job. But if he would want the Hungarians to go through with a pro but he, what the pro he wants them to, the Hungarians to go through is in fact a process that makes sense only on the grounds of collective guilt, that is, recognizing responsibility, making compensation, feeling a sense, uh, a duty to apologize. Feeling shame is not the kind of sentiment that generates a duty to make compensation. Even if I feel shame for what I have personally done, I'm not sure why I would want to compensate someone who has suffered as a result of my action. That would not make me feel less ashamed. But if it is guilt that I'm feeling, then compensation might restore the relationship with the victim and reduce the hostility directed toward me. If the Hungarian Christians felt shame about their or their parents or grandparents' role in the murder of Hungarian Jews, the appropriate response would be to try to hide, to cover themselves, to avoid the gaze of those they injured. This would not satisfy Shoya. He wants them to come out, stand up and be counted. Ideally, they should confess. It seems that these are expectations of people whom we regard as guilty, guilty for what they've done. Now, why does Shoyo care whether Hungarians show contrition for the events of 1944? His situation poignantly illustrates the social meaning of collective guilt. He's both Hungarian and an assimilated secular Jew. He would like to see his offspring merge into the Hungarian majority. Yet if the dominant society rejects its responsibility and its guilt, his total assimilation into the Hungarian nation could easily come to seem to him like a betrayal of his Jewish roots. To understand Shayo's situation, we need only to ask what it would be like to live as African Americans if the, in the United, live as, as African Americans in the United States, if the dominant white political class felt no guilt, no unease whatsoever about having used guns and chains to bring our ancestors to American soil. Suppose the white majority expressed the attitude, you're free now, the past is irrelevant. I should think that this mass amnesia of the dominant culture toward the crimes of the past would be unbearable, both to blacks and to whites. The recognition of guilt provides a bridge for the victims and those who identify with the victims to enter into normal social relations. The recognition of collective guilt then bears important social associations. Even if the guilty are not punished, they put themselves in a morally subordinate position that enables the former victims to regain their lost dignity. We see this practice, if we see this in the practice of punishing Holocaust denial, the crime the Germans call the lie about Auschwitz. At first blush, it is hard to understand why anyone should object to writers denying that Jews were systematically murdered. Why is it insulting and demeaning for Jews to be told in an extreme version of denial, you're just like everybody else. No one ever wanted to hurt you and nobody ever wanted to kill you. No one ever did. Presumably, it would not be a crime for someone to deny the exodus from Egypt, even though this fact is, hard, is much more significant and constitutive of Jewish identity than the Holocaust. And yet Holocaust denial, but not denial of the exodus, is punished as a crime in Israel and virtually all European jurisdictions. The only way I can make sense of this prohibition is to think of Holocaust denial as a prophylactic denial of the nation's guilt for committing a great evil. Why should anyone feel guilty about something that never happened? Would it be, uh, an, wouldn't it be enough to have a truth commission that articulated a public truth about the crimes of the past? I'm not sure. It's important that the dominant group, in fact, recognize their moral burden. They must not only speak the truth, but make a symbolic bow, an act of self-deprecation, in order to acknowledge the relative dignity of those who have suffered. Americans have abundant experiences with these symbolic gestures. 
We are constantly discovering the evils in our past ways. In our robust egalitarian culture, we witness a newly discovered and shared sense of guilt for the sins of Columbus, the elimination of Native American culture, the confinement of the Japanese, the oppression of women, the persecution of homosexuals. Our politically correct speech serves as a constant reminder of our collective guilt. The words by which subordination was expressed uh, have become taboo. And as we ritualistically avoid the N-word and all its analogs, we remind ourselves and each other our language was once a transcript of our evil ways. The irony of Herb Keble's college is that the gesture itself became a crime triggering a new possibility of collective guilt. It's not surprising that every society has its characteristic ways of expressing guilt for its past. For Americans, the reform of the language has become an ongoing project. For continental Europeans, it's important to maintain public truths about genocide. For South Africans, it's enough to hear the stories and confessions of past oppression. For the Japanese, the renunciation of war serves as a constant reminder. The common element is a recognition that cultural continuity and the flourishing of the nation requires the use of memory to institutionalize our guilt as well as our cultural triumphs. Does this mean that the romantics and others who advocate an expansionist methodology have won the argument? Only in part. The stronger the case for collective guilt, the more the liberal spirit of individualism will rebel to protect the sanctity of individual autonomy and the importance of individual responsibility. We must remain on guard against the distortions represented by the doctrines of transmitting guilt by birth and by relying on criteria of authenticity to deny the guilt of those who commit great evil for ideological reasons. But here is the decisive point for me. All the theories and arguments about the past come to a halt when we come face to face with a concrete human being. And this is true both for romantics and for liberals. When confronted with a member of a group that supposedly bears guilt for its collective evil, I can only see another person like myself. Someone who, like Shylock, may be burdened with a mythology of collective guilt, but who bleeds and laughs like me. If this person is to be charged with guilt, we should want to know above all, what did he do? What makes him blameworthy? We cannot judge on the basis of identity, party affiliation, religious beliefs, national association. The group expressing itself in the defendant's actions may be guilty of horrendous crimes, but the liberal form of the law is vindicated. There's no substitute, at least in court, for honoring the uniqueness of every individual. Um, questions, comments, thoughts? Yes, you don't even sign. <laughs>
I think that's interesting, and it's a dangerous, it's obviously a dangerous phenomenon. The theory would be, look, we've got one of them, right? And they're all guilty, so we might as well punish this one. And that's, right. They've been destroyed, they don't right. stay, stay for Yeah. I think that's very dangerous. I agree completely. And I, but the, um, it's interesting because um, there's two kinds of scapegoating. One kind of scapegoating is where the, where the actual offender is really guilty, totally, and we forget about the collective guilt. This is also a mistake because it leads then to excessive punishment of that individual who in fact is guilty. Um, and that, that, that we rid ourselves of the entire problem by focusing on Timothy McVeigh, for example. We forget about all the people who might have participated in the ideological development of Timothy McVeigh. Right? It's very comfortable to believe that an offender stands alone. Or the other kind of scapegoating is, well, well, the individual is not really responsible, but at least we have someone who's a member of the group, so we'll make do. So I agree that both of these go on, and they're both very dangerous. Very interesting. Continue on this, on this path. It's very, very helpful. I mean, I think that um, I realize now, you see, I, I mean, obviously I wrote these lectures before the discussion started on Monday and Tuesday. And there was a discussion, I think, one of those days that a pr with a particular focus on the banality of evil and l what kind of, I think it started, it might have started with Jim Whitman's question and then led to a conversation afterwards. What kind of, expia what kind of excuse is it that everybody goes along with uh, the evil doing, as in, and this is where the college, ex the, the Athena College example is interesting. They all participate in this, and no one has a capacity then for self-correction. No one has a capacity, no one is juxtaposed, uh, no one is subject to criticism. And there is the sense in which they, the, it, the banality of conformity, um, either, and it's hard to know, and it, it, it's interesting because it could, it could be, an, it could aggravate the guilt in the sense that one has a duty to subject the people around one to this kind of critical assessment and not simply follow along. Or you could be sympathetic and say, well, you can't really blame people for going with the pack, right? And so they, we go along with them and the, uh, the banality of the, of the evil provides uh, some kind of mitigation. It's a different kind of mitigation from what I argued in the um, second lecture. That is, it's not, you don't have to reify the entity and believe that the guilt actually adheres in the college, or in the way I argue that guilt can adhere in the nation, <coughs> right? But, um, uh, and therefore, it provides an example of this kind of, uh, how do we evaluate the problem of 
going along with conforming to evil. And actually, I'm not sure how to do that. I think it's a really, the really, big di the really difficult problem to me is to what extent do we attribute uh, capacities for self-criticism in people when there's no confirmation of that capacity in the, in the society around them? They're not getting any feedback that supports a critical posture toward what's going on. All right. How, why, why are they subject to being blamed? Can they be blamed only when there's some possibility for critical self-assessment? Or do they have some internal duty to subject their conduct to critical assessment? What's interesting, of course, about the story is when, when Silk dies, then Cable suddenly realizes that he was doing the wrong thing. There was some shock. The shock woke him up. So there's always this possibility of waking up to the, to, uh, to the fact that one's been engaged in evil all along. Thanks for the question. Are you going to go to the heart of things again, Owen? <laughs> Yes. Because the example of the college is not it. No, no, I think. When you, when you talked about right. the college, you said very clearly that the guilt of the college was that you could understand that as everyone went along, as everyone right. participated. I actually do think that the, these examples that I've given of, um, are, uh, of various forms of social testimony to collective guilt are extremely revealing. That is, the prosecution of. Uh, Holocaust denial is a way of protecting the possibility of collective guilt for the past. Politically correct speech, I think, is testimony to a sense of collective guilt. That we're all aware of the associations with the, of, with the words that we avoid. And why do we do that? Well, there's some sense of collective. We feel that there was something that, in, that was done in the past that was wrong, and it is expressed in the language. And therefore, one avoids complicity in those crimes of the, those actions of the past by changing the language. But can, uh, and this is not my natural inclination here, but can every accusation of collective guilt be translated out in terms of the guilt? some aggregation of individuals. Can I, mean, I, I mean, that, that's what, I mean, the example, the most vivid example was the example of Athena College. Mm -hmm. And the way you presented it in your lecture was that there is collective guilt, but that collective guilt is understood as a guilt of all these individuals. I mean, yes. and, and, and let me just put a slice, which I found very arresting, your last sentence. Remember in the first lecture, in the first, after the first lecture, you, you asked the question about whether romantics are also inclined toward emphasizing individuals as well as collectives. And this is the interesting tension in the romantic tradition. This is why I say that the, when you're faced with the individual right, in court, even though you have a theory of collective guilt, even though you might say that the nation behind this individual is guilty, the romantic response to the individual in court is to see only that person, is to be totally immersed in the uniqueness of that person. Right? And here is, I think, that, and on that point, I think there's a convergence of liberal and romantic sentiments, with slightly different overtones, perhaps, but I think there's a convergence. And at the same time, I think that you, the romantic move would be to say, yes, but there is a larger expressive entity that uh, is behind this action, but it's not in my mind right now when we're dealing with the judgment. Now, it is true that in the second lecture, I tried to develop this idea that, um, that um, 
a humanistic way to bring to bear collective guilt would be as a theory of mitigation. Not to subject people to collective punishment, but to be able to mitigate on the basis of recognition that there's another player. So that, in a way, distracts me from the total focus on this individual. Problem. It's a problem. I, I, uh, I, the question is, can you have it, you know, you have to be able to think, it's kind of, you have to think about both at the same time, right? And uh, then, the, then, the, then I think it's a very fair question to say, but aren't you just, you know, manipulating it so that it comes out in favor of the defendant, right? If you're really honest about it, you might recognize the inculpatory side of this whole inquiry as well. And that, that's the point where, that I resist, that as I want to, I actually do want to think, and I do believe that this kind of romantic association of the, of the nation can have, serves a humanistic purpose, which is to recognize the way we are embedded, to be honest about the way we are embedded in cultures when we act, but at the same time to recognize our full autonomy and uh, responsibility and guilt for what we do. That's what the whole overarching project is. Yes, right. yes Paul. Paul. Um, as I understood the argument, you went from six to three. Yes. And then at various points, try to get back to six. Three to two. So, well, it's not shame. Why? Because I can't tell other people they should feel ashamed. Right. Um, but a lot of what you had to say about six sounded like four. Um, that is, the examples you gave sounded mm -hmm. in discourse. Mm -hmm. We owe an account. Mm -hmm. A truth commission might do the trick. Um, mm -hmm. We shouldn't use words. It sounded uh, at points an awful lot like a theory about collective responsibility. And I, and I was left puzzled still about if it's a theory about collective guilt, I sort of missed it, missed what you had to say about original sin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was such a problem right. yesterday. And right. So how have we avoided that problem today exactly? So it seemed to, it seemed to me that, uh, it wasn't clear to me that you argue a strong case for collective guilt as opposed to the weaker case for collective responsibility, which I think goes to Owen. Uh, Actually, so maybe, well. maybe the model of, of uh, Henry Hart would have been right. Maybe, I, maybe, maybe in fact, the, neg <laughs> the negative <laughs> arguments were right. <laughs> I mean, the, the negative arguments were pretty strong. I mean, what can I say? Uh, today, I tried to revive it, and I, I still think there are ongoing difficulties. Right? Um, I agree with you that there are difficulties. It's not really about the, maybe it is about the collective guilt in this point. So I, I, I like the idea that shame is about who we are as individuals, and it's an attractive way of approaching it. The problem is it gets us from what we used to say about it, but I wasn't convinced that we should be really confused to claim it's associated with the other way. That's right. Yeah. Right. And I, in fact, thought that was a better account of your experience of Hiroshima than the one you were given for the German and the influential tracing camp. That is, my sense of shame about Hiroshima has to do with my sense that Japanese folks were always looking at me and thinking, there goes an American. Mm. It, it is not an experience of reflection on who I am in any sense at all. In fact, it makes no sense to me at all to be there as a reflection mm -hmm. on who I am. Um, 
Lockean way, our own created mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. And what's remarkable about, particularly with eating, about sex, is that both also can be associated with guilt. That in fact, the association of guilt and eating is very old. It's like we have to have food and all sorts of other special requirements on what we can eat. And in fact, of course, today in our dieting culture, guilt and eating are very, very That's interesting. Right. So the argument, the interpretation I would make of those, they're where we are essentially in the way. Because when we are exercising human capacity with regard to those things, say sex or sex, eating or sex, we move into the guilt realm. Whereas with regard to sex, sometimes we excrete all the time. You know, we, we exercise nothing that looks like a human right. capacity. We're back in the shame realm. So that I, I still remain attached to these other ways of talking about the same as guilt. And while the shame is about who we are, what our guilt is about, what we do, formulate it, Oh, I think it's very interesting. Um, you know, I continue to wrestle with these with these problems about uh, guilt and shame for their own sake, even apart from the general thesis of collective guilt. Um, and I don't have a complete handle on it. Um, uh, I, I do. I do think, and, you say, and I think you agree, right? That, that the notion of guilt is more connect. It's collected to hearing a voice. It's collect. It's connected to. Um, the superego and the, the voice of authority, right? Whereas vision is much more collected, connected to shame. And indeed, there is an interesting juxtaposition between Judaism with its emphasis on hearing God's commands and, and the em emphasis on images and the immediate shift in Christianity to images as the central the religious experience and to the portrayal of Jesus on the cross and these things as the central part of the, of the religious experience, whereas that, uh, the, the Jewish view is much different. It's much more emphasis on guilt and not on the shame. I don't know how, I think it's all very interesting in and of itself. It doesn't completely advance me on this project, yeah, but I no, I agree with you. But we'll have to work on this some more. I mean, I, I think it's, uh, and I think that actually now that you point out a kind of easy slippage in the lecture, there's a difference between, I made a, a move that was too fast, and that is um, shame about the genitals is not the same thing as shame about sex. Uh, they're two different things. And even in the nudist colony, people don't start having sex in public. There is not. Well, it's easy to get over. Anyone who's been to a nudist colony is quite surprised at how fast you get rid of it. But that doesn't follow for sex, oddly enough. So I don't know exactly, I mean, uh, what all this says. But it's still, it, to me, it's still, I mean, one of the great interesting questions for me in reading this text in Genesis is, is this purely contingent? that they feel shamed and therefore they put the fig leaves, why don't they put the fig leaves over their mouths or their ears or someplace else? Why is it that the shame is immediately drawn to the genitals? Is that a contingent cultural fact or is it, or is that in the modern way they talk, is it constructed or is there something that uh, is essential about the human condition? Someone 
I don't think it does. Well, maybe my, my experiences are peculiar, but I, I, um, I think that there is some, um, I think that most people have very distinctive personal feelings of unease and anxiety that are connected to all of these questions. It's very difficult for Germans even to discuss the question of Auschwitz. It's very difficult, you know, I remember the debate in the O.J. Simpson case, could he use the N-word? Is the difference who uses the N-word? Can they, what? Everyone feels anxiety about this, right? And it's, what is that all about? If, it, if it's just a feature of the actions, this personal anxiety would not come into play. But I do think that in these, in these situations where I want to argue that there's a collective experience of guilt, there is some way in which individuals participate in this ongoing drama, and they feel it. Right? So the, the, here again, I think it's part of the modern idea of guilt that this feeling of guilt becomes a feeling of anxiety, that the, this feeling it becomes critical to the, to the argument. But uh, so you, I think your suggestion is it's not really guilt, it's just a question of wrongdoing. It's just wrong. But I want to say there's something much more personal about it that we all participate in. And what's interesting to me is that um, it's culturally specific. That's what I find very interesting about it. So that, uh, you know, it's, uh, we all familiar with this problem that blacks can use the N-word with each other, right? Uh, but it's not right for, you know, to, I mean, why is that possible? Because they're inside the culture, right? So, uh, or I remember a German friend of mine would never use the word, could not use the word Yuda. He just couldn't use it, right? He couldn't su use the word Jew. What, what's going on there? I mean, what's the personal experience that's connected to that? It's totally foreign to my experience, right? So uh, I, I don't, if these were objective moral traits, I think they would, they would tend to cut across cultures much more. Whereas I think that there's some personal experience that, that evolves in the, in the particular situation. But we have to pursue this, obviously. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. I think, huh? Thank you very much. It was really nice of you to come. You got to go. Yeah, but I didn't know we had this.